Today we have a late 70s Ludwig stainless steel drum set, 14 by 26 kick drum, 9 by 13 rack tom, 16 by 16, and a 16 by 18 floor. And the snare that's on the set now is a late 70s Ludwig Black Beauty, but Abe brought in a drum that he wanted to play on today, built by Ricardo Para for Para Drums in Venezuela. Mic'd up all these drums with just three mics, and sounds pretty good to me. Today we have Abraham Laboriel Jr. Hello, hello. In the warehouse. <laughs> I was going to try to write down okay. the, the discography. Oh, wow. But, I mean, most people know about the McCartney gig. Kind of. And instead of me rattling off a bunch of names, yeah. I thought that I would just ask you, what, what were the- I should rattle off a yeah, bunch of names. <laughs> <laughs> what, were some of the, what were some of the names that you can remember oh. that, were, that like made you know, an impression? Yeah, I mean, highlight, highlight reels for me. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of live and recording, uh, people who are heroes of mine, um, like Paul, like Sting, like, uh, well, even like most recently uh, working on Richie Sambora's new record, which has been really fun. Uh, I've been a weird chameleon, I'd have to say. Well, that's a, that's a testament to, uh, to your playing yeah. and, and how you, well you communicate with people. Well, I just like music, you know? Like I like, uh, I like songs whenever possible. Uh, so the style doesn't, necessarily inform who I am. It's more, how can I make this song better? So no matter what, you know, if somebody wants me to play a bossa nova or wants me to play double metal speed, whatever the hell they call that. What do they call that? Speed metal? Blast beats. Blast, Blast beats. beats. I actually can't do that. I remember when you, uh, you got the Black Sabbath gig oh, and turned it down. Oh man, that was, that was a hard, that was a hard no, man. That was a hard thing for me to do. But it was one of those, you know, the principles of, of our business. I still believe in first come, first serve. And I was in the middle of a Josh Groban record and had committed for another week. And they and Black Sabbath wanted me to start immediately, and I couldn't. So because I couldn't, I didn't get to make that record. But... I had the best day jamming with Black Sabbath, man. Ozzy and Tony well, and you, can, you have that. You have that to look back That's on. That's the fondest memory, man. That was so much fun, getting to play War Pigs right. with those dudes. In Ozzy Osbourne's basement. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a nice basement, I must say. One of the nicer yeah. basements I've been in. I mean, it's scary. Like, I've had to do, you know, I had to do that with, with, uh, with the McCartney gig at one point, which was really tough. We had finished the record. All this stuff was going to happen. Um, but he, you know, we knew the record was coming out, but he didn't know what he wanted to do touring-wise, and there was no real discussion. So I amazingly started working with Sting and uh, did was in the middle of a tour when Paul decided that he wanted to do shows and... What am I doing in a week? And I had to say, I'm not available for the next two months, but I'll be available then. And I'm getting calls from managers and assistants and all these people saying, don't do this, please, Abe, you know, you're, you're going to lose this opportunity. And I had to say, look, you know, I, if anyone will understand, I'm sure Paul will understand that I've made a commitment and I'm not going to blow off a commitment because something better came along. And I hope he understands that that applies to him as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I hopefully, you know, hopefully the opportunity will come back. And amazingly, it did, you know? He right. waited and then we started up the next year. You've been around the world many times at yeah. this point. Yeah. But what are, what are some of the more craziest situations you've been in? Well, I mean, you know, who, it's very rare to be able to say, oh yeah, I played at Buckingham Palace twice. <laughs> you know, that's right. That's amazing. They asked man. you back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they let me back in. Wow. <laughs> but it's it's crazy, like, you know, or 
a lot of the situations, and, and really, it is it is to deal to do with Paul's status. But you know that we've played the White House, we've played uh, was it the Olympics, the, the opening ceremonies to the Olympics. Like, there's these moments in life that I just go like, what? What? How did I? So the Super Bowl doesn't even come close. So, yeah, <laughs> Super Bowl amazingly is now like down a few, and I and we played the Super Bowl twice. Actually, that was the first gig we did as this band was was the Super Bowl, uh, and that was 18 years ago. So February. 3rd. Third. I remember when you were going off to Berkeley, and yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and and Percaro calls me up and he goes, uh, "You know that little red Gretsch kid I've got in the warehouse there?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Do what you do. Do do the works to that little kit, and then ship it to Abe. Yeah. That's my present to Abe." Yeah, and that's the kind of guy Jeff was. I know, but man. the fact that he. He believed in you yeah. back then. What were you like, yeah. seventeen, eighteen? Yeah, at that younger, point? younger. I, I've heard you talk about Jeff a lot. Was was he one of your main influences, or he was? But yes, he was one of my main influences, but not strictly um, musically. Uh, he was also he was really a, tr a true mentor in terms of he always talked about life concepts a lot more than just playing the drums. You know, several times like he'd call me up like, you know, Junior, what are you doing? I'm, I'm going to the session, I'm gonna come pick you up. So I'd go hang with him. But then there was like this other couple times he's like, hey, what are, what are you doing? I'm gonna come pick you up. It's like, okay, where are we going? He's like, oh, back to the house. And uh, it's like, okay, were you gonna give me a lesson or something? He's like, no, 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 man, we're gonna barbecue and, you know, swim in the pool and hang out. And and it was that, like he he taught me that there was much more to just this tunnel vision of music, you know, that life is important and and um, being able to recharge, really, you know, like that, because I obviously I was getting to a point where that's all I thought about was just music, music, music. Right. So it got to a point where I was just music, music out, really. Right. And I think Jeff could see that. Yeah. And just was like, no, no, dude, pull back a little. Like you're right. mi you're missing, you're missing something, right. and that's something that uh, that even to this day, I I'm so grateful to. When did you realize you wanted to play drums? You know, I was very young, pots and pans, probably 18 months old, pots and pans out, wooden spoons, headphones on, and I jam out, and the parents noticed that, I guess my time was good, and I was actually going for tonalities out of things. And so eventually they broke down when I was about four and got me a drum kit. And uh, with my father being the most amazing musician and amazing person, he um, would bring me to sessions, you know, from, I don't know, probably since I was seven, I've been hanging at sessions with him. And, uh, and everyone embraced me. Everyone would let me hang out. Everyone would... You know, they'd set up another chair and another set of headphones next to the drum kit. And I got to sit there and just watch these guys work. You know, like going going with Jeff to a session, I'd be like, dude, what, what, was, what was that feel? What was that feel? He's like, oh, no, man, no. Come on, you don't want to learn that. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> the bad thing. I want to learn that. And eventually I'd squeeze it out of him, you know. But yeah, I'd be sitting there and go, Okay, wow, interesting that he plays like this or he plays like that or how does he do that? Okay, you know, why so, does he sit so low? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, Jeff, his knees would be up like this, man. It was amazing. Yeah, we had, we had to make a special seat for him. We had to yeah. cut down his seat. That's right. You'd have to it's like, chop it's it like, down. It's right? like the size of like three telephone books. <laughs> yeah, miss him. Yeah. Miss so, him uh, really. And who did you watch? So I got to see. Obviously, Percaro a lot. Um, I would hang with Vinny, uh, with JR, Gad, uh, Steve Jordan, um, Alex Acuna, Steve Schaefer. I mean, like all the guys, Mike Baird, Pooh Bear, you know, like all these guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure I'm missing a couple, but I, you know, my dad worked with everybody, and I got to sit next to every single one of those drummers. And you learned something from every one of every those Every single one. Not to mention just being in the studio yeah. and understanding what it is to be in the studio. Absolutely. How to act. How the to... dynamic, the interaction, the, 
you know, even even to the point of like, why is that guy telling that guy what to do? Oh, okay, so he's in charge. They're listening, but they're still doing what they know is right for the song and, and saving that guy's ass, you know? And just watching that whole dance that happens, um, that still happens, you know? Like helping people to figure out, I know what you think you want, but I also know what you really need without being arrogant about it. But to bring that, that element, again, what we are all in service of is the song and, and making sure that the music is right. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of other things. we got to make sure that the Beats headphones get endorsed right and all this other people that you have to please. Sure. But at the same token, my focus is always the music. Right. Yeah. And there's a reason why they brought you there. I mean, if they, if they yeah. could play the part, right. they would have done it themselves. Totally. Yeah. Right? They, especially these days, the programming and mm -hmm. all the stuff that you can do, the manipulation you can do, you know. Right almost making me obsolete, but right. there's still something that I can do that, that you can't fake. I have, I have a, a similar thing. Mm -hmm. and, with, and there's times when I go in and the, the smart producers are basically saying, hey, this guy's, he did, he's done three sessions a day for the last 40 years. Right. Maybe he knows how to tune drums. Maybe, maybe. He, maybe I could learn something from him. Totally. And then there's the other guys yeah. who are like, they have an idea and they, oh, yeah. and they're like, do it this way, and it's like, I, yeah. I, and you know, at that point, you have to kind of say, okay, that's what you want. Absolutely, let's let's true, let's do it. I'll, I'll do it the way you asked me to, to the best of my ability. Yeah, definitely. And if you if you're happy with that, great. And if not, we can try one of my ideas. Yeah, I mean, that's you know, it's it's amazing how I feel people get tunnel vision a mm -hmm. lot. Like they saw, they read something about, oh, well, this is how the Beatles did it. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. Well, let's start with you had Ringo playing who has a touch that is only his own then you also had the room that they were actually playing in not to mention the equipment and all the stuff so sure let's go for that sound but we have to take into account where we are you know if we want to get that sound in this room with this person playing with these drums we have to do something slightly different than what they did but again also the tunnel vision thing like this there's also they only maybe put two guitars and a bass track on top of all of that too. So there was a lot more room for the drums to breathe. A lot of the music that's getting made now, so compressed, mm -hmm. saturated with 10 tracks of guitars. Mm -hmm. We've got a choir of didgeridoos on one thing and you know, but why can't I hear the air around the drum kit? Well, cause you have a bunch of shit on top of it. So yeah, when you build a record, you have to think that way. Right. Yeah. But hey, we've been having some fun, man. The, the, that Bob Rock sessions that we've been doing. And first of all, just getting to work with him, getting the sounds, like it's one thing like, you know, you tune them, I play them, and then he captures them and makes them larger than life, man. It's, it's, it's special. That, that is the beauty of working with, with some of the, the better people. Yeah. And he's yeah. right up there. Oh, one, 100%. And it really, it really, raises the bar to a point that when you work with somebody who's not quite there, yeah. you feel it. Yeah, it's like, know? oh, now we're working now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he makes it so easy and sounds so good. It just, totally, it's like, it's like his, his sound and his input actually propels the session along. It's like, it's like you're yeah. floating down the river instead of yeah. swimming against it. Yeah, and I, joyfully, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> well, that was that brings me to the set that I have uh, yeah, put man. together for you. They have sort of a, a special relationship with you. Yeah. Right? And I always try to pick a set that has a relationship to the drummer Perfect. in one way or another. And, Perfect, that's, and sometimes yeah. I'm really reaching, but, yeah. but this one was like, okay, we're, this, this is like falling off a log. Um, this is uh, this is set of set up because uh, we were doing a session with Bob. Yeah. And uh, you would call me and say, hey, we're working with uh, Richie Sambor yeah. next week. And these are the drums I want. Yeah. And then my next phone call was a call from Bob. <laughs> and he goes, bring whatever Abe wants. Yeah. He goes, but bring me something different. Right. Bring me something special yeah. that, that I, ha I, I wouldn't ask for. Totally. And I eat that up. Yeah, Because man. I've got 400 and some odd sets of drums here. <laughs> yeah. I love it when someone says, hey, man, bring me something that people don't use. Right. Because something it gives different. me a chance to kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Different flavor, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely, it's like it's like having strawberry when you're 
eating vanilla yeah. all the time. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I bring down the stainless steel kit. Yeah. And we, I remember we got the sounds on your... Yeah, the regular stuff. The regular stuff. And then there was and, one song, right, that we did a tom overdub. Right, that's right. And it was like, well, let's use these stainless steel toms. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a couple more. There's like, a, yeah, there's like two more rack toms. Right. So doing this big, it's like, whoa, these things sound amazing. They're, because you, you, at first you think, oh, metal, it's gonna be way too bright and tinny and, but they're warm, but they, they have a sustain and a vocal quality to, to the notes. You know, mm -hmm. like you really hear tone. Mm -hmm. And so, then it was like, well, let's let's put up that kick drum. Right. <laughs> and then the, before you knew it, we're using that kit for right. like the rest of the session. Right. Man. It sounds so good. Yeah. And then that was the inspiration for me to go beg on hand and knee to John Good. It's like, dude, I, I know this is weird and you've probably heard this a million times, but I just play the stainless steel kit that I'm in love with and I don't wanna mess up the brand and do all this stuff, but do you think you could do this as an experiment mm -hmm. for the next McCartney tour? And he said yes. And that became the, the kit that I've been playing for, what, the last three years now or four years? And it's amazing. It really is a great set for you, yeah. too, because um, people who haven't played on a stainless steel kit, uh, it's, it's everything you said. Everybody... Right. Or they're kind of afraid of them. Oh, totally. And there's certain clients that I would be afraid to bring them into because they'd look at me like, oh my God, are we going to be able to get a sound on that? And <laughs> right. I'm, I'm how, am saying, I gonna, how am I going to do this? And, and I'm thinking, <laughs> come on, you, you, wait till we put a mic on it before you say anything. You exactly. Know? But it is interesting, like how many people, engineers, yeah. artists, whatever, they, they listen with their eyes first. <laughs> and, yep. and, and it's hard to go like, no, wait. <laughs> you, you do, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you know, listen with your ears and you, then you, tell me that it's not going to work. You, you have to be diplomatic in yeah. that situation. Kind of yeah. give them a, a chance to hear it. Totally. And, and then, you know, then let them, let them discover it for themselves. Absolutely. Like, I remember, you know, obviously when I first came on the scene, what was that <laughs> early, early 90s, it was, it was pretty standard. Everyone played 18 by 22 inch kick drums. 12, 14, 16, 18. It mm -hmm. was that was like the standard thing. And I was always like a one up, one down, maybe one up, two down guy. But I liked bigger drums. I liked, first of all, it's a vanity thing, I will be honest, because I look ridiculous behind a small kit. I'm a full but. man mountain behind <laughs> this. <laughs> so I liked the idea that, oh wait, this kit is now conforming to my size. And, and and then it sounds amazing. Now, <laughs> do you think that the size of the drums and the fact that it's usually a 26, mm -hmm. is that helped you develop your style? Or do you think you Definitely. had your style and then you just sort of... A, a, you just sort of adapted it to the bigger drums. No, I think I gravitated towards that sonic thing. Like I always was trying to get low, but but again, maintain tonality. And going low on a 22, you end up getting flabby. Mm -hmm. So being able to get that low rumble of a 26 mm -hmm. or a 28 even, which I was doing for a long time, mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, like it, it, I then play to that tonality and feel much more comfortable. And and again, like I feel like then I'm in a different sonic space than where everyone else is accustomed to. And there's more room for the bass. There's more room for the guitar and whatnot. Cause I, now I'm giving you attack, but a lower fundamental to the drum kit. So now everything else can kind of resonate in a better way. So yeah, for me, it was, it was always about wanting to, to be able to hear myself in those situations without having to, like I don't, when I play live, I don't have drums in the monitors. Mm -hmm. It's all what I what the kit is giving me, mm -hmm. and then I have little floor wedges so that I can hear whatever I'm missing from the rest of the band, mm -hmm. um, which is rare. Most guys do like a full PA behind them and you know like crank up the subs on the kick and crank this all, but the actual drums don't 
sound that way, you know? So I like the drums to be as acoustic, almost from a jazz standpoint. That's the sound I want to hear. And then whatever the sound guy has to do out front, you know, I trust. But but for me, I need to hear them doing what they do in front of me because right. I play differently that way. Yeah. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to be in the, in the room when you've been asked to play delicately. Oh, yeah. And that is a, a thing of beauty. Oh, man. Because here's this... <laughs> Mountain of a man <laughs> with with rather large drumsticks <laughs> playing about as soft as anybody could oh, play man. and still <laughs> grooving his ass off. Trying to get my Joey Warren card on, man. <laughs> still, I don't know how he does that, man. It's so beautiful. You know, he mixes himself. And that, that's what most of us who are still able to do this mm -hmm. do. You know, you go into a room, sure, we can put up a bunch of mics, but you could also just put up one mic mm -hmm. and get the sound of the kit. Yeah. And that's that's something that he does so beautifully, right. man. Keltner does the same thing, you know, like those are the guys that I love, you know. Actually a lot of the guys who are here. Well, Josh, all, you know, I mean, all, come on, man. And, but but everybody's got their own like bandwidth or something. Sure. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's what we hope to have to have that, you know, at least have an identity and and uh you know, yeah, it might not just be stylistically. It might be, again, like w what you love about music and what you bring to it and what you bring to the to the party, you know. Because often I'm, you know, finding myself more and more, you know, as I've been singing more and, and pl you know, playing more guitar and stuff. Like, yeah, like on this Richie record, he's having me sing harmonies and almost doubling his lead on a bunch of stuff. I, I played guitar on a couple songs, like... This is Richie Sambora, you know, one of the greatest guitar players. And he's like, do that, do that. And I'm like, okay, so I'm I'm tracking stuff on, you know, so I'm having these great almost band-like experiences as mm -hmm. as a, as an independent dude, you know. Yeah. It's fun, man. Yeah, well, you're, yeah. you're singing behind McCartney. You may as well sing with uh, Richie, it's, too. It's crazy, man. You yeah. Know? yeah. Come on. I remember <laughs> the first time we, I, I was, the first time we were recording with Paul and, uh, and it was one of the new one of the new tunes that he was playing us, and we had tracked it. And I started singing a harmony in the room, in the control room. And he went, "Ooh, what what's that?" I'm like, "Oh, just something I'm hearing." He's like, "Yeah, let's go do that." And the two of us got on one mic, headphones on. I'm like, "Oh my God, I'm I'm singing with my hero on the same mic on one of his new tunes." You know, so that that has always sat with me, you know, right. and I still get to do that. Well, <laughs> and he is another special person. Oh, He's a very really. cool guy. Yeah, he is. And in fact, this reminds me of a story. Mm. Uh, I, it may be the first time you brought me in to work with yeah. McCartney. Oh, for, oh yeah, at Capitol. <laughs> right, at yeah. Capitol. And, <laughs> and you called me up and said, we want kind of like a James Brown thing. Yep. And I, you know, and he said it's for, it's for it's for Paul. Yeah. So I said, well, let me let me give this some serious thought. What, what I'm going to set down there, right? <laughs> so I think we actually had a meeting. Yeah. I, I put some stuff together. Yeah. We actually had a meeting. You were you yeah. gave your blessing. Oh yeah. What I brought down Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah. So I bring the stuff down. Mm -hmm. and I set it up and I work with the engineer. Yeah. For an hour or two. Yeah. And then you show up, and then Paul shows up. Yeah. And. Uh, he says, "Well, let's let's see what what we've got." Right. So you went out and you started playing, and uh, Paul turns to me. He goes, "Have you have you got a uh, a snare a little higher than what I, what you have set up?" I said, "Yeah." So I, I went out there, put up a different snare, put it up, and he gave it another pass. Yeah. And, and correct me if I yeah, no, if, no, if no, I'm no, if I'm totally. doing this wrong. Yeah. Um, and then McCartney said, "No, you had it right the first time," mm -hmm. and he turns around. And he gives me a high five. He goes, nailed it. <laughs> and I get a high five from Paul McCartney. And that is still one of the high high points. That's pretty cool. It was very cool. <laughs> if I'm ever having a bad day, oh. I try to remind myself of, yeah. hey, I had a high five from Paul McCartney. How and bad how could it be? And how great is that? Like, he is still that invested sonically. He's still paying attention. There's so many guys that would just let somebody else. But he really, he is a producer. And he really sits there. I mean, there's lots of times in the sessions with him where he'd, you know, we'd, we'd do the same thing, and then he'd be like, yeah, the kick drum's just not, let me go out there. 
And he goes out, he's like, hit the kick drum, puts his ear right down there, starts like messing around with muffling, messing around with, yeah, let's tune it up. But like, he's still that guy, you know, he's not sending minions off to do stuff. He's like a do-it-yourselfer still, right. man, yeah. We, you know, I often forget that a lot of his first couple of solo records, he tracked himself with a microphone and he'd put the microphone in different places and be like, okay, now that sounds right. Okay, let me start with the guitar part and then I'll do the drums and, and you know, so he's, he's that intimately involved in every aspect. I love those records. Oh, so good. Those records. So good. So handmade, yet totally. so soulful. So right man. on and yeah. Yeah. yeah, you hear the space that he's in and the head that he's in. And yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful thing, inspiring. Yeah. Um, what is Pocket? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. It's funny. I just have to say there's a friend of mine who, uh, whenever he's working with another drummer, producing another drummer, or just hanging out, and, it's, and that Pocket isn't there, he calls them sweatpants. It's like, come on, sweatpants. Get it together. <laughs> Because he's got no pocket. Right, exactly. Um, so, yeah, pocket is, it means many, many different things. I, I mean, the, the, you could, one, just say that it's feel. And feel is subjective. It's feel, I think, has a lot to do with consistency. Um, that whatever the song requires, that you're in that zone from top to tail. Now... We all have different pockets naturally, but there's also some times where you have to play differently. There's a, a tendency with like British players to play center to a little bit on top, time-wise. Guys like Phil Collins or um, Carl Palmer, you know, guys like I don't know. There's like there's like this very driving hi hat and the time is there, but that's a good pocket. Or there's Jeff, who was the king of so laid back, you would almost think, is this slowing down? But it wasn't, it was still moving forward, but where he placed the backbeat made it feel just lush and deeper, even on a fast tune. Question. Yes. Do you think that that was just his natural feel for it? Or do you think that he had the control over that? I think that was his natural feel. Yeah. I really do. Um, same with Gad. Gad has a similar thing where you think he's not going to make it to the end of the bar, but it's always he's always right there on the one and his backbeats are always consistent. I think that's where those guys really just, that's where they felt it, where they feel it for Gad. Um, I I studied it a lot because number one, you know, my dad would always tell me who his favorite guys were to play with, and they were, you know, it was it was Jeff and Gad and guys like that. So he, I'd be like, okay, so what is it? What is it? And I'd sit there and I'd he's like, play me a bar, you know, play, play, just play a groove. So I'd play, and honestly, a couple minutes would go by, and then my dad would tap me on the shoulder. He's like, yeah, 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 that. That was a good bar. <laughs> it's like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> what did I do? You know, so I'd sit there and I and I learned how to start manipulating where that gets placed. And um, and there's some producers who do take advantage of that now, where they're like, no, can you play more center? Or no, I actually want you to play a little more ahead. And I I can fake it pretty good, you know. I I do have a, a tendency, I think, to go either center or a little bit back. I don't go quite as far back as as like Jeff did or or as Gad does. But but yeah, you know, I can if 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 the song really calls for it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I guess pocket really to me is consistency, and and again, I know I keep saying this, but playing to the song but making sure that you're not distracting from the music and and propelling it in the right way, but being from note one. You have, there's sometimes where I've been in sessions and it's like, okay, it's take three and here we go. And by bar two, I'm like, nope, stop. Okay, 
we got to start again because I'm not in it. I got I got to find it again and get back to it. And often when I do a count off, I'll be playing the groove for at least you know six bars and do like one, <laughs> two, one, two, four, boo, and then and so then I'm in it and I'm already in the zone by the time we kick into the tune. So that's a little trick I try and do. So yeah, to me that's what it is. It's it is a consistency. Do you have any words of wisdom from from being on the road and? That's something that you'd pass on to the younger drummers who mm. are going to watch this and say, hey, I want to, maybe I can get a shortcut because yeah. Abe went there and, and. Yeah, I mean, I I guess the, the main thing that I keep going back to watching this amazing generation of musicians coming up that are taping themselves, doing the most gymnastic incredible feats across a drum kit and it's it's amazing to watch and it's it's very fun but it's very insular and uh for lack of a better phrase it's very masturbatory it's very self-gratifying and that has its place but i wish more people played with other people and I think that's how we grow the fastest. When you engage with somebody else and you see how what you're doing affects somebody else. Because it's one thing, whatever you do by yourself will affect yourself fine. Because you have no idea how it might come across to somebody else. It might throw the singer, it might distract the bass player. It might excite them to do something that they never would have thought to do. And then symbiotically will then feed you into like, whoa, wait, he went there. I never thought I could continue this and interpolate that and go further with this idea, the seed of an idea that I had. So I think a lot of people are getting this weird stunted growth where they can do incredible things, but they don't know why they're doing them. There's no purpose, there's no goal to it other than I can play faster and I can play, um, you know, standing on my head, which is great. It really is incredible. But again, to what purpose? For me, it's always about how do I draw the audience in? How do I let them in on the joke? How do I make them feel a part of the thing? All of that. So. As much as you can, I'd say to people, you know, play with other people, whether it's another drummer, whether it's another guitarist, whatever, you know, whatever, just play with people because that's, that's the most inspiring way to move forward. That's great. That's great input. It really Thanks, is. Man. I think people will really get a lot from that. I think, it's, that's, I think that's what has to happen now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> also, we need community. We need to engage with each other. We, just in general in society, I think we, we're, we're reaching this point where, you know, and I'm guilty of it too, where it's just staring at the phone and seeing what's going on. And, you know, I, I that's what they're saying right now is that the number one issue that people are going through right now is loneliness, you know. And, and it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah. But some of it's self-made, you of know. Of course Because we're scared to, to engage with people or whatever, you know. So... Yeah, so I, I would I would encourage as much as you can, just get out there and be with people and, and engage. Make, and make real friends. Yeah, make, yeah how about <laughs> that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't thank you enough no. for coming out. This this I'm really glad we can make this work. Me too, man. I'm able, honored, brother. Anytime. <laughs> Come over and have a, a hang with it. When we're doing the next we're having the next drum. Oh, I love it, man. You yeah. can heckle them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> so what relevance? Where's your groove? <laughs> <laughs> Hold up the sweat.